Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season, we're addressing the various parables of Jesus, which are contained in the Gospels. And this week, the parable of the calculating of costs, which is found in the Gospel of Luke. It's a short parable, but because of some of the terms used in it, it needs a fair amount of explaining. So let's take a look. For which of you, having a mind to build a tower, doth not first sit down and reckon the charges that are necessary, whether he have wherewithal to finish it? Luke 14.28 If you're going to start a difficult project, you need to first figure out whether you have what you need to finish it. Finishing only half a project does nobody any good, particularly in the case of something like a tower, which isn't useful until it's done. Lest, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Luke 14, 29-30 It's not just useless, but humiliating to try to achieve a large goal and completely fail. In the context of this parable, this refers to reaching heaven. We need to be ready to do what's needed to accomplish that central goal. Or what king, about to go to make war against another king, doth not first sit down and think whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that with twenty thousand cometh against him. Luke 14.31 The example of the battle between two kings is the same kind of parable and told for the same reason. If we don't have what it takes to finish a certain endeavor, we should be wise and recognize that. Or else, whilst the other is yet afar off, sending an embassy, he desireth conditions of peace. Luke 14.32 if we can't accomplish the goal we're trying to accomplish, we look for some other way to resolve the situation. In the same way, if we fail to abstain from sin, we can go to confession, appealing to God for forgiveness, so we can be at peace with him again. So likewise, every one of you that doth not renounce all that he possesseth cannot be my disciple. Luke 14.33 Oh dear! Some part of this phrase seems to have been imperfectly translated, or else some meaning in the Greek original has been lost in the translation to English, because in English the word renounce means to give up, refuse, or resign, usually by formal declaration. Now, I don't say that this is a problem because of attachment to possessions on a personal level, but rather because there are many situations in the Gospels where Jesus has the chance to tell people to give up all of their possessions, and yet he doesn't tell them to do this. Here are just a few examples. Luke 5, 10-11 has Peter, James, and John leaving their nets and fishing boats to follow Jesus, and in Luke 18, 28, Peter says they've left everything to follow Jesus. Yet in John chapter 21, after rising from the dead, Jesus appears to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and they still have their fishing ships and their nets. Also, there is no indication that Peter sold or gave away his house, leaving his wife and recently ailing mother homeless, which is more of an argument from silence, but still interesting. In Luke 19, 8-9, Zacchaeus offers to give half of his goods to the poor and to pay back four times what he's cheated anyone of in the past, a restitution that would only, according to Jewish law, be required of a person who cheated someone out of pure malice. There's nothing in the Gospels to indicate that after this, Zacchaeus was poor or homeless, yet Jesus says salvation had come to his house. This seems to indicate that Jesus didn't want Zacchaeus to give up everything he had, there's more, of course. The book of Proverbs, for example, specifically says that people should be like ants, working hard and storing up food at the right times, which wouldn't be possible if they gave everything up. However, I think the strongest evidence is found in Luke chapter 5. And after these things he went forth and saw a publican named Levi, sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said to him, Follow me. And leaving all things he rose up and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house, and there was a great company of publicans and of others that were at table with them. Luke 5, 27-29 Here we see clearly that Levi, later known as St. Matthew, left all things, yet he still had a house and plenty of food to treat a large number of guests to a feast with. So there's every reason to think that when Jesus talks about renouncing our possessions, he's not talking about giving them all away to the point where we become destitute. What we do see in each of these cases is that these disciples of Jesus all put aside their possessions and followed Jesus. They treated their possessions as disposable goods, or as a means to an end, in the case of Matthew, 
rather than as an end unto themselves, which they needed to protect and secure. We can see this in the way the people of the early church in the first chapters of the Acts of the Apostles shared what they had with those members of the community who needed it so that no one was in need. Their possessions and goods they sold and divided them to all, according as every one had need. Acts 2, 45 I think this unusual level of generosity provides a clue about what Jesus really means by the word that's translated as renounce. Perhaps renounce isn't meant like renounce your motorcycle, but rather as in renounce your allegiance to your motorcycle. We human beings place so much stress on our goods and maintaining them, and maybe what Jesus is asking is that we put those in a lesser priority so that we can serve him with our goods. That would make sense and be consistent with all the examples we've seen so far. Our worldly goods are just tools, not something we're obligated to keep and use if doing so gets in the way. Next, the master and servant. That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.